A few months ago, who would have thought or believed that there would be a shortage of toilet paper? Well, but that was before the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the last couple of times I was in the grocery store, which is more than a month ago, I was shocked. It was surreal when I walked down the aisle and saw huge empty spaces where there usually were hundreds of packages of toilet paper of all different kinds of brands, and now there was not one roll of toilet paper available. Of course, there are other shortages due to the pandemic. There's a shortage of, and it's very expensive, there's a shortage of meat, certain kinds especially of uh, frozen and canned vegetables. There's sometimes a shortage of sugar or flour, uh, and certainly of uh, products that are used for disinfecting. Now, as Americans, you know, in a time of blessing, we're not used to shortages like that. We're not used to empty shelves in the grocery store. Now, some of you who are a little older than I will remember rationing in World War II, or further back, rationing during World War I, but we're not used to this. In fact, very few of us have ever sincerely and literally had to pray, Father, give us today our daily bread. Well, that petition, which we're going to talk about some more today, comes from the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew chapter 6. Let me read it again. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Well, we've been looking at that prayer that Jesus gave us uh, for a number of weeks now. And in fact, last week we started on this petition, Give us today our daily bread. And remember we learned from this prayer that God is the ultimate source of every good thing, every blessing we have. And that God often chooses to provide our needs in response to prayer. Jesus' half-brother James in the first century, in his letter in our New Testament, wrote, Every good gift, every perfect gift, comes down from above from the Father. I suppose you could say it this way, All good things are God things. All good things are God things. Okay, then, recognizing that God often provides our needs in response to our prayers, like this one, give us today our daily bread, how? What's, what are the ways that God answers this prayer and provides our daily bread? I've, I've thought about that a lot. And let me suggest to you three ways. Number one, sometimes bread, representing all of our physical needs, is provided by God's supernatural intervention his supernatural intervention. I'm talking about miracles. Now, remember, by definition, miracles are unnatural. They're outside. In fact, they're in contrast to or in contradiction of the laws of nature. A miracle is unexplainable. A miracle is impossible. There's no natural or scientific explanation for a miracle. A miracle can only be explained by the supernatural. By God. Now, miracles, therefore, are uncommon. They're very, very rare. Miracles don't happen very often. If they did, they wouldn't be unnatural. They would be natural. But the Bible certainly gives us some illustrations of God supernaturally uh, intervening to provide bread or, or some other physical need. Let me, let me give you some illustrations from the Bible. During the 40 years of wandering on the way to Canaan, the promised land, God provided bread, <laughs> bread-like, I should say, a bread-like substance for the people to eat every morning. They called it manna. And when they got up in the morning, it was on the ground like dew, and they would go out and gather it every day except the Sabbath, and then they would eat this bread that God miraculously provided. 
Now, there was no natural or supernatural explanation, no scientific explanation for that manna. It happened once in history during the 40 years of wandering. It was a miracle. Or do you remember the story of the, the widow's oil in 2 Kings chapter 4? What a great story. Here was a widow, obviously no husband, her two sons, uh, and she had run out of pretty much everything. In fact, they were so deeply in debt that her two sons were about to be sold into slavery to pay off the debts. All she had was one jar of olive oil. And remember the prophet Elisha said to her, get your sons to go door to door, all your neighbors, all your friends, everybody, and ask them for empty jars, empty containers, and bring them to your house. And then he said, now pour the oil into them. What a ridiculous thing to say. She only had one jar, and there's all of these empty containers. But you remember the miracle of God's provision. When she began to pour the olive oil from that one jar, it filled another jar. And she looked, and there was still oil in the jar. And she poured it into another, and still there's oil, and another, and another, and another, and another, until every container that they had gathered was full of oil. There was so much that when they sold it, they were able to pay off all of their debts, and they had enough money left over for them to live on. Wow! That is a miracle. That is God's supernatural intervention. There's no natural explanation. There's no scientific explanation for how that one jar of oil just kept pouring out more and more. Of course, when Jesus came to earth and began his earthly ministry, John chapter 2 in the Bible records his first miracle. It was at a wedding feast. Remember, he provided an abundance of superb wine when they ran out. Now, he did so not in any ordinary way of producing or procuring wine. In fact, what he did was he, from a distance, miraculously converted, transformed water, six huge jars full, hundreds of gallons. He instantaneously, from a distance, not touching it, not adding anything to it, transformed the material and chemical nature of that water into a different substance that was not just water, but also fruit and sugar and alcohol and tannin. And just like that, it was all wine. And remember, the caterer said, why did you hold this wine back until now? This is the best wine of all. Wow. You know, he didn't follow the normal process that took years to produce wine. You plant a seed, you grow vines. After several years, they grow grapes. You harvest the grapes, you crush the grapes, you know, you, you let the, the juice ferment and all of that process that takes years. No, without being close, without touching, Jesus miraculously, no scientific explanation. It was God's supernatural intervention, a miracle in providing that wine. Then, of course, there was Jesus feeding to the massive crowd with a little boy's fish and chips lunch. Remember the story? Apparently, they all had come and listened to Jesus teach so long, and they didn't think to bring their lunches, but one little boy's mother said, you're not going unless you take this food. <laughs> and, of course, then Jesus took that little boy's lunch, and somehow between Jesus' hands and the hands of his 12 disciples who distributed to the crowd had been gathered in little groups of 50s and 100s, that little boy's lunch miraculously multiplied so that 5,000 men plus women plus children were fed and full, and there were 12 baskets left. There's no natural explanation for that. There's no, super, there's no scientific explanation for that. It was supernatural intervention. It was a miracle. Now, most of Jesus' miracles in the Bible were miracles of physical healing. And those were supernatural. There were no doctors. There were no medicines. There was no recovery time. Infections, viruses, bacteria, injuries, accidents, you know, all of the symptoms, all of the damage done, in an instant of time it was gone and the person was fully restored to total health and wellness, just like that. You see, sometimes God answers our prayer, give us today our daily bread and all that bread represents. Sometimes he does that with supernatural intervention, but you know what? It's very rare. It's not common. We, most of us, have never seen that kind of clear, miraculous intervention. So the second way 
that God much more frequently answers the prayer, give us today our daily bread, is sometimes the bread and all it represents is provided by God's providential provision, by his interaction with people and circumstances in such a way that the provision is made. Sometimes we might call those miraculous, but as you'll see, I'm making a very important distinction. In reality, it's the precise convergence of unlikely circumstances with extraordinary timing that results in this providential provision. Like the story in 1 Kings 17 of the prophet Elijah and the ravens. Do you remember? Uh, bold, usually, bold Elijah had confronted the wicked king of Israel. His name was Ahab. It's become you know, synonymous with a wicked ruler. And as a result of that confrontation, his life was in danger. And so God said, Elijah, I want you to run and hide. There's a ravine east of the Jordan River. Hide there. And what God did, of course, there was water in the brook that ran through the ravine. But what God did to feed him was he sent ravens who every day brought chunks of bread and Elijah ate them. Now, now think of this. You know, it doesn't take a miracle for a, a raven to steal somebody's piece of bread. It doesn't take a miracle for a raven to perhaps accidentally drop it on the ground where somebody else could pick it up. I mean, that happens. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a precise convergence of unlikely circumstances with extraordinary timing. Because every day, here came this squadron of black ravens flying, I don't know if they were in formation, but they came swooping down into Elijah's ravine, and at precisely the right moment, like a bunch of guided bombs from B-52s, they dropped the bread so that Elijah could pick it up and eat it. Oh my goodness. Now you might say, well, but that was miraculous. Well, I suppose that's easy to say, and how God directed the ravens to do this, we don't know, but, but the point is, he didn't miraculously create bread. He didn't go poof and the bread appeared. He used natural means to accomplish his providential provision in a way that was stunning because of that convergence of unlikely circumstances and extraordinary timing. Uh, more recent, but still way in the past, there was a preacher in England in the late 1800s whose name was George Mueller, sometimes called George Muller. George Mueller started a hundred orphanages for English children. A hundred twenty thousand orphans were cared for under George Mueller. He also started a uh, hundred Christian schools that educated, with a Christian education, a uh, hundred twenty thousand children, not just the orphans, but others as well. But here's the even more remarkable thing. He didn't have a PR agent. He didn't send out fundraising letters. In fact, it was George Mueller's policy to not ask people for anything. He didn't ask them for money. He didn't ask them to drop off groceries. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But that was just what God, he felt God had led him to do. He only told God about his needs and asked God to provide. And for those 100,000 orphans in orphanages, uh, for those 120,000 students in his 100 schools, God provided. Sometimes people would just stop by and hand him money, or they'd mail him money. He hadn't asked them. They just did it. I mean, he didn't invite them. There's one story where M Mueller was in a particular orphanage sitting at the dinner table. It was dinner time. The orphans were all gathered around the table. The plates were there and the utensils and the glasses and cups. And they had no food, none, zero. And George Mueller sat down at the table and said, let's thank God for the food. And I can, can't you just see those orphans looking around and saying, what food? <laughs> but, but Mueller prayed and thanked God for, for the, the food. And as he finished praying, there was a knock at the door. And lo and behold, a large bread carriage had broken down right in front of the orphanage. And the baker knew that the bread would spoil before he could get the carriage repaired and delivered. 
and so he asked Mueller if they would be willing to take all of the bread from his carriage. Oh my goodness. Now, that wasn't a supernatural, scientifically unexplainable thing. I mean, the baker made the bread, he put it in his carriage, he drove it to where it broke down. No, it was the convergence, the precise convergence of unlikely circumstances with extraordinary timing that God providentially provided bread. When uh, our kids were young, there was a time when we kept uh, a prayer journal and when we'd sit down and read a Bible story and pray, we had this book where we would write down the things we prayed for and the date we started praying. And then if God gave an answer to that and provided what we'd asked, we would write down, praise the Lord, put the provision in, and, and write the date. There was a time when our very old uh, vehicle had bald tires, one especially bad, unsafe to drive, and so we began to pray and wrote it in the prayer journal. We were praying, didn't want to be greedy here, we were praying for a tire, a new tire for the vehicle. And lo and behold, soon after we started praying, someone contacted us and said, we want you to go to Lansing. There's a car dealer there where there is a car waiting for you. And I think I probably said, well, I'm, you know, we'll have to try to make payments on it. We can't. And the person said, no, 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 you don't understand. The car is paid for. It's yours. It was a brand new Chevy station wagon. I think, I should have asked Gloria because she could remind me, I think that's one of only two vehicles we have had in 50, nearly 53 years of marriage. I think that's one of only two vehicles that we got brand new. And by the way, the other was also an unexpected surprise gift. It was God. Now, he didn't miraculously produce a, a Chevy station wagon in our driveway. He didn't say poof, and all of a sudden it came, part, parts flying from all over the neighborhood. No. Somehow God put it in the mind and heart of an individual and said, Reds need a car, and they were able to do so, and they bought it and contacted us. That's God's providential provision. You know, we often pray... Uh, for people's healing, physical healing. And though God doesn't always answer that prayer the way we hope, there are many times when the person gets well. And while there may be times when that is a miraculous thing, it's also true, and perhaps much more often true, that the person gets well as a result of doctors, and hospitals, and medicines, and exercise. Uh, it's not instantaneous, it's over a period of time. But stop and think. All of that healing process involves the God who gives us every good gift. You know, the doctors had the strength and ability to go to medical school and to learn and to remember and to practice. The medicines are all made from some chemical or substance that God put in his universe and gave scientists and researchers the intelligence and the curiosity and the work ethic to look at God's creation and find a substance that they could use in such a way that it would bring healing to people. You see, it's not, number one, the miraculous supernatural intervention. It's number two. It's the providential working of God to bring together people and circumstances in such a way that he answers our prayer for his provision. Uh, Renee Moser was a young woman who dramatically came to Christ, or back to Christ, God knows which. She came to Christ as a result of aggressive brain cancer. She cried out to God to forgive her sins, to be her Lord and her Savior. I don't know that I've ever seen a person grow spiritually as rapidly as Renee did. And as she was praying, she often told people that God was going to heal her. She didn't know whether he was going to heal her miraculously or through doctors down here, or if he was going to heal her by taking her home to heaven, where she'd be totally healed. And she said, it's okay, whatever God chooses. But as she was declining, getting worse and worse, so that she wasn't able to be out and about and telling people about Jesus and the story of how he changed her life, she decided that she would write her story, her testimony of what Jesus had done for her and what he meant to her and how she had hope even with this 
terminal brain cancer. She wrote her story and she sent it to the newspaper, the Muskegon Chronicle, and lo and behold, they printed it. It was long. It covered a, a big section on a page of the newspaper. That night, in one of the Muskegon prisons, a prison guard had that a copy of that newspaper in his hand, and as he walked by the cell of a career criminal, he tossed the newspaper into the cell. Now, the criminal was, uh, he was in prison, but he was high on drugs. And, and when he came around and was awake and alert, he picked up the newspaper, began to go through it, and he came to the story, to Renee's story, and God spoke to Jeff's heart. Jeff wrote a letter to uh, Renee, and there was a chain of circumstances here, but as a result of Renee's testimony, Jeff, a career criminal, came to know Jesus as his Savior. And when he was released from prison, he began to come to our church. He was baptized. And we, with great excitement, watched Jeff grow in his brand new life. We watched him touch other people's lives. We touched him, watched him talk to young people to say, don't do what I've done. God transformed his life. It was a dramatic story. You know what else it was? It was a series of providentially directed events. You know, precise, uh, extraordinary timing. <laughs> the day as she wrote it, the newspaper being tossed into Jeff's cell, using people to bring this all together. It was God's provision answering Renee's prayer that her testimony would bring people to know Jesus as Savior. I keep in a dresser in, up in uh, my office here at home, I keep this hunting knife. Perhaps you can see it. It's not a brand new knife. That's very solid. And there's a story behind this that if, if you've listened to my preaching for any length of time, you may have even heard me tell the story. It was back in uh, the first church where I was a senior pastor, and it was visitation night. Some of you remember back when churches would set aside one evening a week when the people would gather at the church and They'd be put into groups of twos and threes and handed cards to go out and visit people who were sick or shut in or maybe who had visited church or had, had reached out and said, I need some help. And this particular night, uh, we divided up into the groups, and I was the odd man out. There was nobody left to be my partner. So I took, I think, three cards maybe, and I said, well, I'll just make these calls around town myself. And nobody was home. There was a part of me that, that just said, oh, good, I can go home and just spend a quiet evening. But then into my mind popped a name. Uh, one of our members had a father who was an alcoholic, and she was very burdened for him, not just because of the, his addiction, but she knew he needed Jesus in her life and that he was the one, Jesus was the one who could set her father free from this alcohol addiction. And so I thought I probably should go visit him. Now, the problem was I didn't have his address. He lived maybe 15 miles up the road in a very large mobile home park. But I figured, you know, I'll get there, the office will be open, I'll stop in and I'll say, where's, where's his home? And uh, let's give him a name. Uh, let's call him Mark, though that wasn't his name. You know, I'd stop and say, where does Mark live? Well, unfortunately, when I got there, the uh, office was closed and there was virtually no one outside. So I thought, well, I'll just drive around a little bit and I'll probably see somebody on the street, and I'll stop and say, Do you know Mark? Do you know where Mark lives? So I drove a little ways, and I'd turn right and go a little ways and didn't see anybody. I'd turn left and didn't see anybody and take another left and see, turn around. I mean, I was just kind of wandering around, I'd go right, go left. And finally I said, This is ridiculous. I'm just going to stop, knock on a door, and say, Do you know Mark? Where does he live? So I parked my car, got out of it, and uh, went and knocked on the door, and a voice inside said, Come in. I opened the door and stepped in, and there sitting on the couch was Mark. Hundreds of mobile homes in this park. This was Mark. And he was sitting on the couch with this knife in his hand, just like this, but holding it in front of his belly button. And I said, Mark, what are you doing? And he said, I was just about to commit suicide. His plan, not the way I would choose, though I wouldn't do it anyway, but his plan was to stick the knife in his belly and basically disembowel himself and, and bleed to death. 
Well, that night it was my privilege to tell Mark that he didn't need to do that, that the guilt he felt, the shame, the addiction, that Jesus would help him with that. And that night, uh, Mark opened his life to Jesus, who came in and made a wonderful difference. Mark gave me that knife as a reminder to me of how God sometimes providentially brings people and events together with precise timing in stunning ways in order to provide what we need. Now, sometimes God provides through providentially manipulating, uh, influencing circumstances. And sometimes that's how he answers the prayer, give us today our daily bread. There's a third way, and frankly, this is the most common way that God answers our prayer. We probably don't realize that it is an answer to prayer. And that is sometimes bread, and all it represents, is provided by God's personal enablement. That is, he enables us (laughs) to make something happen. You know, thousands of years ago, Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. (laughs) I think I did all of this on my own? (laughs) No, no, no. Moses said God gave you the ability to get wealth. You see, many times God answers our prayer for provision by endowing us with the intelligence the ability, the creativity, the health, and the strength to go out and find a job and go to work every day and get a paycheck so we can go out and buy bread or whatever else it is. Well, somebody may be saying, I don't need prayer for all of that. I don't need God for all of that. I can do that on my own. Oh, really? Moses said it's the Lord who gives you the ability to get wealth. The coronavirus has certainly reminded us that no matter how smart, strong, hardworking, creative, and well-connected we are, an invisible virus can change everything, bring a world to its needs, its knees economically. You know what? God is the giver of all good gifts. And the only reason that I'm able to have a job, to work, to have the health to get it in, the intelligence to, to do this, to go and buy food, and All of the whole supply chain is the same. God provided that. Of course, we can ignore that and pretend that it's just us. And then the coronavirus reminds us of how helpless we really can be. You see, if I understand that, it will give me a great sense of gratitude. Every time I have the strength to go to work, I should say, thank you, God. Every paycheck I get should trigger my gratitude to say, thank you, Lord, for that. Every time I walk out of the grocery store with a bag of groceries, which I'm really looking forward to, uh, I should be saying, thank you, God, for that. You answered my prayer. Give us today our daily bread. Now let me kind of move towards the finish line here by reminding you of some lessons that we can learn from this petition. Most of these, I'll just give them like bullet points and not even talk about them. For example, one lesson from this is that God cares about our needs. Another lesson is that God cares about our bodies, (laughs) bread, food. God cares about every detail of our lives, big and small. And we learn from this prayer, give us us today our daily bread, that God wants us to pray for others and with others. Praying for others calls us to love instead of selfishness. And praying with others requires us to gather, to be with other people instead of isolating ourselves. Another lesson I learned from this is that God wants us to talk to him every day. Give us today our daily bread. Now there's a world of difference between the first century culture and ours. They had no refrigeration, no preservation uh, for perishable items. They had to go to the market virtually every day, and there are places in the world and people in poverty, for whom that's still true. Uh, You know, because if you kept bread and kept meat and uh, kept fruit without something to preserve it, you'd be dealing with moldy bread and spoiled meat and rotten fruit. Just think how disgusting that would be to have to eat. And so there was a very practical side to this give us today our daily bread. It's a little bit different for us, isn't it? And we who have been un usually blessed by God, have pantries and refrigerators and freezers that have food in them, 
but we're really not praying for today's bread because we probably could live for days or even weeks off of what we already have. But the principle is still the same. And the fact is that God wants me to recognize that I'm dependent on him for everything. Remember, every good thing is a God thing. And so it's a reminder that God wants us to talk to him every day. Maybe this is a lesson in contentment also. You know, too often we think about what we don't have or what we think we should have and then we'd be happy. A great deal of our economy runs on the gasoline of greed and the idea of more, more. But scripture suggests that if you have what you need today, you have reason to be grateful and content. And so every time I pray this prayer, give us today our daily bread. If I've got a freezer with food in it and a cupboard with food in it, that's a reason for gratitude and contentment. One more lesson. And that is that God wants us to make today our primary focus. You know, some people are always living in the past, aren't they? Either the good old days or the bad old days. They can't stop thinking about past victories or past defeats. They, they're constantly thinking about past successes or past failures, about past hurts or past kindnesses. They're stuck in the past. And there are other people who seem to be always living in the future. You know, they're filled with worry or fear or anticipation or expectation or dread or hope. You know, people can be so focused on the past or the future that they can't function well or enjoy today. <laughs> They have trouble dealing with today's challenges, today's opportunities, with enjoying today's pleasures because they're consumed with the past or the future. I like the old saying, wherever you are, be all there. And you know where we all are? We're today. And that's always true, you know. Today is where we are. And so this petition calls us to focus on today. Give us today our daily bread. You know, today is the only day we have for certain. Uh, we read in the Bible in Proverbs 27, do not boast about tomorrow because you don't know what a day will bring forth. Who expected what we're experiencing now? James warned us in chapter 4 of his letter, listen you who say today or tomorrow we're going to do this, we're going to go to this city, spend a year, do business, make money. Why, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're like a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. Now, this isn't a condemnation of planning ahead. It's not saying don't think about tomorrow at all and make no plans. Rather, it calls attention to the foolishness of leaving God out of our plans and failing to recognize that the accomplishment of those plans is totally dependent on God. Therefore, we pray, give us today our daily bread. Remember the story Jesus told, the parable in Luke 12? The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I've got no place to store my barn, my crops. Well, he had no shortages. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones. I'll store my surplus grain. I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? Today is the only day we have for certain. So I need to realize that the challenges and opportunities of today require my full attention Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble in it. If I spend, expend too much energy on yesterday or tomorrow, the past or the future, then I'll not have the energy to do what needs to be done today. So I need to learn to live one day at a time. As this prayer calls me, in a childlike relationship with the Father, full of trust and dependence, I need to believe in the power and the value of prayer, to pray every day about what I need or, or, or need someone else does. And the prayer, as we'll see later, reminds us about maintaining a loving relationship with others, about being willing to forgive and reconcile, you know, today. And this prayer reminds me to, to seek provision today. 
And it's in connection with others because we don't pray, give me my daily bread. It's give us our, the whole prayer, us and our, not I, me, and mine. You see, if I'm unconcerned about those who lack daily bread, if I don't generously give help to those in need if I am able, why would I think God would want to respond to my prayer? Why would I expect God to give me what I selfishly withhold from others? I hope that this understanding of this prayer will change the way that you and I pray every day for the rest of our lives. That when we pray, give us today our daily bread, our prayer wraps its arms around people around the world who have no daily bread and moves us to pray for them and, if we can, to help to provide. Let me close with this. There's something worse than living without our daily bread, and that is to live without God. We are not just physical beings. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 4.4, 4, Man shall not live by bread only, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's why many times the scriptures are compared to food, to meat and milk and uh, fruit and honey, because this is what nourishes my life. If I want to live with God instead of without him, I need that food. And that's why Jesus revealed himself as the bread of life or the living bread. John records in chapter 6 that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Yes, I need daily bread, but what I need much more is I need Jesus, the bread of life. Thanks for joining us in this study today.